department. Been here almost three years, not quite. I've got an education degree, supposed to be teaching biology, chemistry, and physics. What the world am I doing in track? Diesel. Well, after I got out of college, I got in the truck and in the oil business. Made a whole lot more money than I did teach. So, spent 15 years in the trucking industry, pipeline industry. I uh, ran 100 trucks, seven shops, had several thousand miles of pipeline operating control. So that's where I got some of this information. A lot of the information is going to be here today. You're never going to hear from the education world. When you get into a management position, you're going to be able to go to some seminars. You're going to have this little seminar, four-day seminar in Dallas, $400 or $900 or $1,000. And the boss is going to send you off, or you're going to decide to get. And this is where I picked up a lot of this information. Not in my education classes where I was taught how to teach, but in seminars that I could go to as a manager and keep the information there. This is not for education. How many of you have chosen your profession and have chosen to be mediocre in it? I mean, you don't want to be mediocre at the profession you've chosen? What do you want to be? You want to be the best, don't you? You want to be the best you can be at your chosen profession. Now let me ask you this. What's the difference between the being the best and being in second? What's the difference in pay? It can be substantial, can it? What's the benefits, you know, rewards to yourself? The difference between being best and being mediocre. How does it feel to be the best? Yeah. Feels good, doesn't it? Well, let me ask you this. How much difference is there between being mediocre, or being second, and being best? Okay. Well, what is the differences? Now, let's look at a horse race, for example. Run a quarter horse, spang her out of the gate and run down there. And first place comes in that far ahead of second place. What's the payoff for first place? It's about double what second place is, isn't it? Well, how much better was the first place horse than the second place horse? <laughs> well, I'm sure you all know that in a quarter of a mile, there's 15,840 inches, right? So if first place beat second place by an inch, would you agree that first place was 115,840th better than second place? It's not much difference, is it? Little things are going to make the difference between you being first and you being mediocre. It's not the big thing. It's a group of little things that you can try and you can work with daily. It's going to make you be first. In life out there, you've got an awful lot of competition for the first 40 hours of the work week. But after 40 hours, your competition is going to drop dramatically. Am I right? That's when you're going to get the opportunity to shine. Now, first thing I want to go through is some little memory techniques, little memory tips. So, let's start out with a test. Turn your papers over there. Oh, need one? Anybody else need one? Okay, I'm back side of your paper there. Now, without looking at anybody else's paper, because this is a test, and without looking at any of your notes now, Write down the names of the Great Lakes. The Great Lakes. Okay, anybody everybody that I didn't call her name? Look at the name on here. How many are there? How many are there? Well, everybody got them down now? Everybody got all of them down. Okay, now what if I give you a little tip? What if I tell you that the first letter in all the names, if we put the first letter together, spells homes? Okay, what's 
starts with an H? Huron. 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 What starts with an O? Ontario. Ontario. What starts with an M? Michigan. I had that one. What starts with an E? Erie. What starts with an S? Superior. That wasn't tough at all, was it? <laughs> now, probably after I told you homes, probably after I gave you that little memory tip, some of them came to mind, didn't they? Maybe not all of them, but some of them came to mind. Okay, this is a little memory trick. This one you've probably seen before in high school, grade school. You might use the first letter of each word. You try to remember and make a silly sentence or whatever out of it. But it works. How many of you think you have a fantastic memory? <laughs> All right. <laughs> the rest of you are all wrong. <laughs> the rest of you all are, are all wrong. You remember everything you have seen, smelled, touched, tasted in your whole life. Sometimes you just have a hard time recalling it. <laughs> <laughs> just have a hard time recalling it. You remember everything. They've done a lot of research on this. One specific thing I think of was a lady about 93, 94, was having some brain type surgery, and they went in and they touched some electrodes in her brain, stimulated some area in her brain. When she came back out of surgery, she said, You know, I had the most fantastic memory. I remember my fifth birthday. I remember my friend Susie was there. My friend Bill was there. My friend and Susie had this beautiful dress on. I just remember how much I loved it. And it had these kind of flowers and these ruffles and this. And I remember the birthday cake mom made. It was a beautiful strawberry cake. And it smelled so great. Something this woman had not remembered. Had completely forgotten. It was completely gone. She hadn't recalled it in years. All of those memories, everything you have seen, smelled, touched, tasted, are there in your brain. You just have a hard time recalling them sometimes. <clears throat> now, how many of you ever bought groceries? How many of you make this big old long list as you're going down buying groceries? You check this, yeah, I got the bread now. Yeah, I got the potatoes now. Oh, shoot. Here in the middle of the list, you didn't have one checked off, so you got to go back here three aisles, right? Get this one over here. Do that? Okay, so we're all practicing buying groceries at some time in the life. Okay, so I'm going to give you a grocery list now. Don't write it down. You just need to remember this when we're going to buy groceries. And we need some watermelon and potatoes and milk and bread. Now, don't be writing down. And frosted flakes and sausage. And some long more cheese and some strawberry ice cream. And let's pick up a frozen pizza while we're there. And uh, let's see. We need some light bulbs. The light bulb burned out the other day. And some paper towels. And let's get a TV guide because we've got a new season starting right now. So we'll see what those new shows are going to be, right? Okay, what was the first thing on the list? What was the last thing on the list? TV guide. What was the fifth thing on the list? <laughs> <laughs> what was the fourth thing on the list? Bread. 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 <laughs> <laughs> so we remember, so we can Makes it a little tough, doesn't it? What if I could give you a way so that you could know that? Would you like to know how to do that? Mm -hmm. Okay, it's a memory <laughs> technique called stacking. We're going to stack a weird, ridiculous, crazy, silly picture in our mind. And the reason we're going to make a weird, crazy, silly, ridiculous is because that's the best way you remember. And another thing I want to tell you, you don't remember words, you remember pictures. If you want to remember something, you have to visualize it. You have to make a picture of it in your mind. And then you will remember. If you don't make a picture, it's gone. 
you won't be able to recall it. Okay, so we're going to start out with our grocery list here. Now, remember when you go to the supermarket, you grab that shopping cart, you're walking down there, it's got that one bad wheel. Remember getting that one? Well, that's the one we got. Here we go. We're going down to the produce aisle because first thing we're going to get some watermelon, right? Uh, if I get over here, we see this watermelon. Man, it is beautiful. It's already been cut in half. We can see that it's right. Got beautiful red meat, those beautiful black seeds. Boy, it's glistening. Mm. Oh, smell that watermelon. Oh, it smells so good. Smell it? Oh, that's the one we want. So we're going to pick that thing up. Look at that. It is so big, it won't even sit down in the shopping cart. We're going to set it up on top of that wire basket there. You see that little half watermelon set up there on top of that basket? Oh. Well, look at that. Boy, it looks so good. I almost want to eat it right now. But well, we got to get the rest of the shopping done, don't we? Well, the next thing we wanted on our list was some baked or some potatoes. Well, I'm going to get some of those great big old baking potatoes. Because I got some friends coming over, and I told them we was going to have steak. Well, I get some big potatoes, I can serve them little steaks, and they'll still get full, right? <laughs> Sounds like a heck of an idea, doesn't it? So we're going to get some of them big old baking potatoes. So we walk over there by the potatoes and grab one, and stuck them right down in that watermelon. And another one, whoop, whoop, whoop. They're going to roll off that way, right? Couldn't get them down under the basket. The watermelon covered it up. So now we got these, this half a watermelon sitting there, these four big old baking potatoes sticking out. It kind of looks like an upside down footstool. Can you see that in your mind? Okay, the next thing we need to get, we need to get some milk. So we walk on over here, and we get some milk. We get a gallon of milk, we grab it by the handle, and we balance it real carefully on top of those four potatoes that's sticking up there. Now, now we got to be careful with that dead gum shopping cart. we got that milk balanced up there on top of those four potatoes. Next thing we need to get was some bread. So we go over there by the bread aisle. What are we going to do with that bread? Oh, let's just shove it through that handle on that gallon of milk. That way it can't get away, right? <laughs> then it's just kind of hanging out of that handle on both sides now. <laughs> now, they say we need to use some frosted flakes. Now, who's responsible for frosted flakes? Tony the Tiger. What's Tony the Tiger say? Yeah. Yeah. It's great. But this time he's saying, you're great. Well, that makes you feel pretty good, doesn't it? You're great! Now, we take old Tony the Tiger and we set him up there and he's sitting up there on that, that lid of that milk. <laughs> sitting up there. And he's got his feet propped up on that loaf of bread that's through that handle. See old Tony sitting up there on that lid of that gallon of milk? <laughs> sitting up there. Now, the next thing we look for, he does, old Tony, he's got something up there in his eye. He's looking through it like a telescope. The next thing we need to get our grocery list was some sausage. So guess what he's holding there in his hand? Sausage. Uh, a big old roll of sausage, one of those two or three pound rolls of sausage. He's looking over there and he's saying, you're great. <laughs> well, what's he looking at? Sausage. <laughs> sausage. No, he's looking at that longhorn over there because we need to get some longhorn cheese. Now this longhorn that he's looking at over there, that body on that longhorn, he's got a, you know, one of them half rounds like longhorn cheese. He's got a longhorn bull standing over there. He's got this funny body that's made out of cheese. And the next thing we need to give us some strawberry ice cream. So remember that old bull, you know, that they got up on top of their shoulders? We're going to take a big old dip of that strawberry ice cream in our pitcher. We're going to put it right up on top of that flat on that longhorn cheese. And what's going to happen to that ice cream? It's going to melt, isn't it? What color is that stripe coming down that longhorn cheese? The nice pink red color, isn't it? Now, what have we ever heard this so far? Okay, now we got our bull out there. What do bulls and cows normally 
do when they're out in pasture? <laughs> they're out there eating the hard table. What's this old bull eating? Instead of eating grass, he didn't eat frozen pizza. <laughs> Flying out through the mountain, eating on that frozen pizza. And the next thing we need to get some light bulbs. Remember this is a longhorn? So guess what's coming out of that horn? See these fluorescent tubes up here? Little light bulbs. Fluorescent horns coming out. And we need to get some paper towels. What are we going to do with those paper towels? Oh, well, let's just throw, slide those leaves right down those fluorescent tubes. That's got a bell roll of paper towels on each side of his head now. And what was the last thing we need to get? TV guide. TV guide. Well, what color are paper towels going to come? Wow. Pastel, white. You know, they've got all these little flowers and designs along the side. When we start looking at these paper towels, and what's on those paper towels? That's a front cover of TV guide. Every time we pull it, another cover of TV guide. Now, what do we got on our grocery list? Watermelon, potatoes, milk, bread,
Okay. Can you remember those? What's Zerah? Zerah. What's two? Zerah. 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 Three trees. Four, five, six, seven, eight, two.
shifts, right? You know how to take care of this. Boom! And you bust through that big old yellow door. And there's a whole bunch of your friends and they yell. Anything you want to remember. <laughs> what were they going to yell? Yeah, like, happy birthday! Or whatever. But what color is white wine? Kind of clear, isn't it? And he starts to pour it out. And this wine starts coming out there. It looks like white latex paint. Wait, whoa, 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 stop. What kind of wine is that? And what's on the label? Anything you want to remember. Nine wine. What color is that wine? Ten pins. Ten pins. Got to class today. Teacher says, okay, everybody close up their books. Get us pens and paper. We're going to take a test. And you go. Could I borrow a pen, please? I said, yeah, you can use that one over there in the corner. And you look over there in the corner, and there's this ink pen. It's as tall as you are. <coughs> and it's huge. It's about this big around. <laughs> oh, my gosh. How am I going to use that? You look at it. I said, well, I said, I can take my test paper. Lay down here. So get your pen. And start filling it out. And what are you writing? Anything you want to Okay. Let's go over and see if we got those numbers down now, the colors. One. Brown. Brown. One running. What was running? That big old brown racehorse. Two. Red. Two zoo. What color was that? Four. Four door. And it's orange or yellow. Five. Five hives. Five hives. It's a green hive. Six sticks. Eight. Eight gate. It was gray. Ten. Ten. Ten pin. It was gold. What? It's a big old gold pen. What makes it heavy, doesn't it? Big right out there. What was three? Orange tree. Yeah, three trees. Orange tree, what? See how you got those memorized down? Now, on a little piece of electronic equipment that's got little stripes painted on it, each one of those colors represents a number. And if it's red, green, brown, that's going to tell us how many ohms of resistance that little thing has. How hard it is for electricity to flow through it. So what is the red number? Two. 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 What was green? Five. What was brown? One. Now we know the resistance value of that resistor. Okay. For some of you, that's complete nonsense. You never met with resistors in your life. Some of you may be helpful. So, let's make a list of, of miscellaneous things. Would you keep the list for us if we write it? Does everybody call us out? <laughs> just, just write down what they say. That way we, you can check it out, make sure everybody does it right. <laughs> Will you? Yeah. Okay. Zero. What color was zero? Black. Black. What, what symbol represented it? Circle. Circle. Yeah, zero yeah. everything. What's up we need to remember? What's something you need to remember to do that? Homework. What kind of homework? History. Okay. What's the class number? Okay, we just say history. Okay, so we got to remember history homework. Okay. See that airplane flying back there? And where are you studying? Early American history? Or scenes? Before since since 1865, yeah, 1865, written up there on that circle in that airplane. So we got history with 1865. Okay, see that? See that? One eight six five, written in some of the letters in black on that black spot. One. What else we need to remember? Yeah. 
Make up daughter? Okay. Make up daughter from daycare. And what was the picture for one? A race horse. So who's up there on that horse? A baby. A baby's up there on that horse. <laughs>
Okay. What was number eight on list two? Oh, uh, eight gate. What was written on that gate? Go to work at five o'clock. What was number six on list one? No, list one. Blue sticks. Blue sticks, what? <laughs> yeah, so virus said, what was number six on list number two? Oh, yeah. oh your mother, wasn't it? <laughs> Does this work? How many of you thought that you could have two different lists of ten items or eleven items and be able to keep them separated? You know, remember them. And, and but keep them separated too. Is your memory any better than it was a few minutes ago? No, you got the same memory you've always had. But you learned a technique. You learned a technique to help you recall. You have a fantastic memory. Everything you've ever seen, smelled, tasted, done in your whole life is in your brain. Sometimes you just can't recall it when you want it. There's a whole group of these memory techniques. We just touched a couple of them. I've got a floppy disk at home. It's a shareware program called Memory Master. After you go through 10 or 12 of these techniques and learn how to use them, they say you can flip through a magazine and memorize it. You can go out to Las Vegas and play cards, and you can remember every card that's been played. What does that tell you? What card's left, isn't it? It's not that you don't have a good memory. It's that you never have been taught how to recall. And those techniques and tips are out there. How many of you think that if you'd been taught how to do this in about the second grade, that you might be better off right now? If you had learned, instead of that teacher say, memorize this poem. If that teacher had said, this is how to memorize the poem and told you a technique, would you be better off? How many of you are starting to get angry with your grade school teachers now? <laughs> Some of us are not there. I had to wait until I was making big bucks could afford to go to the $900 a week seminar so that I could learn how to do that. You don't learn that school, but you should. And that's one reason why we break it up in this group here. Hopefully it can help you as you go on through the rest of your courses. These things become easier as you practice. Remember the first time you ever drove a car with a stick shift? Now you got in that car and you you post in the clutch and you put it in low gear. Dad was sitting over here, mom or brother or whoever. They said, okay, now give it just a little bit of gas and let out of the clutch. He's ah! They killed it and jumped over two curbs. They don't never learn how to do this. It's so tough. But you practice, and a couple of weeks later, you're sitting there in your car. You take off from the stop sign. You change tape in your video, or tape player, switch the directions on it, get to rewind, roll down the window, wave at your friend, and light up a cigarette all at the same time. You practice, and it became <clears throat> intuitive. You didn't even have to think about it. Did you? Don't even have to think about laying out on that clutch slow again. These memory techniques, if you practice, get to be the same way. They get to be intuitive. Some studies done with some legal students, medical students, and they have a lot to memorize. A lot of time, or very little time to spend doing it show that after they have taken some of these courses like this and begin using these type of memory techniques, when they get ready to take a test, it's like they had the whole textbook laid open right in front of them. And you don't forget it because you have attached it to something you can recall. 
they're learning some of these techniques. Some of the medical and legal schools. So that they can have that book in front of them when they're standing up doing their speeches and their talks and working with their patients or whatever. You can do the same thing. Now, how many of you said you want to be mediocre in your field? No, no. You all want to be the best. You're going to be working with manuals and information and people and all this stuff out of your chosen profession. You don't have a lot of time to be rereading information. You need to read it once and have it, don't you? Same thing in these classes. How many of you have just gobs and noodles of spare time now? You do? Well, great. You need to get a couple more classes. Most of them are really, really busy. We don't have time to waste. We need to be able to study it and study it efficiently so we can continue on. <clears throat> That's one of the things I want to talk about next. I think the next page on your first page on your handout, note-taking skills. So turn over here to note-taking skills. You will probably continue to take notes throughout the rest of your business career. And one of the things that I like to emphasize is make sure that you date each set of notes. Each day you start writing, make sure you date it. Now, I didn't learn this in school. I learned this out there on the job. Because today the boss is going to come in and say, we need to get this done, get this done, ship this to so-and-so, and make sure you contact someone else, and you write it all down. Now, two weeks later, the boss comes and says, why in the world did you ship that package to those folks? My gosh, they called me up and they have been chewing on my tail. That wasn't the right stuff. Oh, my God. Why in the world did you ship it? And you flip back about two weeks of pages and said, because right here is where you told me to ship it. Now whose problem is it? Okay, another thing you can do with that list on those days we all have where you can not do anything right. I've never done anything that I've worked, worked all day today and I haven't accomplished a darn thing. I must really be a sorry person. But you can look back at that list and say, oh, I got that done, I got this done, I got this done, I got this done. Maybe I did accomplish something today. Maybe I'm not such a sorry person. I am getting things done. And I got it done the way people wanted it done. Hey, I'm all right. I'm okay. That list, that notebook can help you do that. So date your notes and continue to use your notes, continue to take notes throughout your business career. Keep your notes separated here at school. If you take your history notes and turn over two pages, take your English notes and turn another page, you take your math notes, then when you get ready to study for your English test, you turn over here and you read this page of English notes and you flip through for 10 more pages to find the next day's English notes. You flip through another five pages to look at the next day's English notes. You've wasted time. Keep all your English notes together, your history notes together, and the ones from your chosen profession, keep those notes together. That way when you get ready to study them, they're all right there in nice and neat order and you don't have to waste time trying to find it. Keep them organized. Try to write your notes in outline form. Guess what I'm looking at up here as I walk by? Looking at an outline, all right. How was your textbook written? An outline. What is your instructor speaking from? An outline. Why do we write outlines? It helps us keep things organized. If things are organized, we can remember them better. Write your notes in outline form so that they will flow and they make sense and that you can remember them better. As you write your notes, use your own words instead of the instructors. Use words that you understand. If you write those down in words that you understand, they'll mean a lot more to you. 
two or three days later or a week later when you get ready to study for that test. As you, as the instructor gives examples or writes something on the board or gives a formula or anything like this, dates, names, make sure you have those down exactly like they were written. What happens if you write down the formula wrong and then you go to work a bunch of problems using that formula? <laughs> Every one of those problems is wrong, isn't it? Because you wrote the original formula down wrong. So make sure that you write this specific information down exactly like it's presented to you. Make sure that you correctly record all names, dates, formulas, equations, rules, etc. Be sure to write down everything the instructor emphasizes. Be sure to write down everything the instructor emphasizes. Be sure to write down everything that I say two or three times. Be sure to write down everything I say two or three times. Be sure to write down everything I say two or three times. Okay, we've got in our class with you the one that you paid me to share information with you. We have 75 to 90 hours that we're going to be together in that classroom. I've got a lot of information that the people that are going to hire you have said, these people need to know this. 75 hours is not a lot of time to give you a bunch of information. I'm not going to stand up here and repeat myself a bunch of time you know, over and over and over again just to hear myself talk we got a lot of stuff we need to cover. If I repeat it, guess what? It's probably important to you. It's probably important to those folks that are going to hire you when you graduate. So, when the instructor changes inflection, when they start talking soft, or when they start talking loud, or when they repeat themselves, make sure you got that information down. You're going to see it again. So you're going to be on test, you're going to need it as your job. <clears throat> Over at the LRC library, there's a set of tapes that you may want to take a look at sometime. You've probably seen them advertised on TV. It's called Where There's Will, There's Day. And instead of charging you $79.95, like they do on TV, if you learn, they're only $49.95 for you to view them over at the LRC, right? What do you mean no? They're free over there, aren't they? You don't have to pay a thing. You go in and say, I'd like to see where there's a will, there's nothing. They hand it to you over the desk. You go into one of the little rooms over there. You plug it into the VCR. And you sit there and watch it. You've already paid to use the equipment over there, haven't you? Take advantage of it. There's some good information on those tapes. It takes about three hours to run through them. And I know there's going to be some evenings coming up when everything that's on TV is really sorry. <laughs> and, you know, buddies that you was going to go with, they done took off without you. And you don't really have anything to do. Run over there and take a look at those tapes. It's about a little longer than a movie, and it can make a difference between being a mediocre student and being an excellent student. Which can make the difference between being a mediocre employee and an excellent employee. And that's what you're all here for, isn't it? Get that job. Okay, turn over to your next page there are suggestions and top rates. First one, and probably the most important one there to get in your mind. This isn't high school anymore. Nobody made you come. They twist your arm and say you got to go into whatever department you chose. Or if they did, and you don't want to be there, time to go and get into a different department. Get into something you like. You will excel at things you like to do. Make sure you're in a school or a profession that you enjoy. If you're not, find one that you're doing and get there. 
because that's where you can excel. First thing is be aggressive about your education. Your six semesters, two years, 90 credit hours, whatever it takes you to get out of here, is going to cost you between ten and fifteen thousand dollars. By the time you pay books, tuition, room and board, all this good stuff, you're going to spend ten, fifteen, and maybe a little more these next two years. Now, if you went down to the car dealership and you bought you a fifteen thousand dollar car and you drove it around for a week or two and it started going clunk clunk and clunk, 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 smoking, and what are you going to do? You go to that service manager or salesman and say, hey, what's going on here? I just spent $15,000 for this car and it's not doing what it's supposed to. You better make it right. You're spending the same money here. Make sure you get what you're paying for. You're the customer here. Make sure you're satisfied with the information you paid for. You hired me to share information with you and lead you towards a goal in your life, a goal in your education. You paid me, didn't you? You paid for my time. When you show up for class, you're using up some of what you paid for. If you don't show up, guess what? I get to pay anyway. And I don't even have to worry about looking at your face, do I? Be aggressive about your education. You're paying for it, get what you paid for. If you have an instructor that's not giving you what you paid for, let somebody know. Talk to the instructor, talk to the department head. Talk to somebody. Be aggressive about your education. You've already paid for it. You want to pay for it. Use the tools of big business. Why do big businesses use computers and copiers and telephones and faxes and recorders? Why do they do that? It saves time, doesn't it? How much extra time did you say you had? Not much, did you? So use the tools of big business. These tools are going to save time. If they save work time, what can you do with some of that other little bit of time you have? You can relax, can't you? You can enjoy yourself. We all need to have some relaxing time. It's a time for meditation, quiet time, but we've also got to get a lot accomplished. Use your time wisely. Next one there says neatness on papers counts. Studies have shown that if we take the same words, commas, periods, and handwrite them, and have somebody type them, and have somebody run through a word processor on the computer, and then hand them out to a bunch of English teachers, guess which one gets the best grade? The computer written paper will get the best grade. Why is that? Well, what about handwriting? It's tough to read. None of us enjoy doing it. That teacher doesn't either enjoy reading. What about that typewritten paper? What's the difference between it and that computer paper? On that typewritten page, if you got three or four mistakes in it, are you going to type that whole page over again? I'm not. Now, these little fat fingers only go about 30 words a minute. I'm not going to type that whole page over again. I'm going to save it out there and say maybe they'll miss those three or four mistakes. But what does it take to correct those three or four mistakes on the computer? You move the little cursor up there and you type in an A instead of an E and print it. We didn't have to type the whole paper again. A computer written paper will receive the best grade. Is that fair? It's not fair. All the other papers, they had the same words, same columns, same periods. But if anybody ever told me the world was fair, they lied to you. But if you know what is your advantage, you can use it. If you don't 
what the advantages are, you may be the one that gets left behind. Use those tools to make business. Use those computers to write your papers. They'll help you out. They'll get you a better grade. People who sit in the front row get the most attention. These guys sit right here. It's a lot easier for me to make eye contact with them than those way back over there. And when you sit back there, what do you see? You know, you see where I slept sideways on the pillow. You got the funny hair back there. You see where that ball spot is. You see the back of my baseball cap. And you... What do these folks up here on the front row see? You see the instructor, the person they've paid, they've hired to teach you. The folks back there on the back, they're seeing all those fancy hairdos. Heads bobbing around. It's distracting their attention. They're not seeing what the instructor's doing. All they're seeing is what's going on in front of them. They have to keep dodging around. Yeah. What's he writing up there now? And when you're sitting on the front row, how, is, how hard is it to ask a question? It's just right there. Now, some of these classrooms over there in the classroom building, we've got 40 or 50 in them. The only way you get in is from the end. Now, if you ask me a question, i got to go clear down over here at the end. Excuse me. Excuse me. Excuse me. Excuse me. Sorry. Let me get my hair. Excuse me. Sorry. Excuse me. 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 How many questions are you going to ask? <laughs> now, that's going to be the last one, isn't it? With that person up there on the front row, it's easy to ask it. Sit on the front row, you get the most attention, you get the least distractions. You get the best information. As you read your notes, or you're studying your notes, mark what you do not know. Big time saver here. Study what you don't know. You already know information about the field you're in. You know, you know some information about the English class, you know some information about the history class because you've had them two or three times already. Study what you don't know. What's the use of wasting time studying and reading what you already know? It's a waste of time when you don't have the time. One of the examples that I found was a man that was taking 16 hours college classes he was a roofing contractor. He had three roofing crews out there. Didn't have a whole lot of time, right? Because he had to go out and get bids. So to get his roofing done, he had to make sure that the lumber yards got the, the roofing materials there. He had to keep make sure he had all his hands showed up so they could do the jobs when they were supposed to, when they were promised. Plus, taking 16 hours college credit. Busy man. His solution was to write what he didn't know on a three by five car. And then as he sat in the pickup waiting for homeowners to come where he's gonna give them a bid on what it's gonna cost to do their roof, he studied what he did not know. You have time as you walk from the dorm to class or as you walk from this class building to another class building to look at some <coughs> sentences on a three by five car study some of the things you don't know. Use it to your advantage. Now, what did we remember best when we first started this out? When I gave you that grocery list, remember what thing? First and last. First and last, didn't we? You remember first and last best. So, instead of studying, cramming for three hours, how many first and last do you have? One first, one last. What if you break that up in little short 15 or 20 minute sessions? How many first and last do you have? You got a bunch of them, don't you? If you'll study in short sessions, you'll retain a lot more information. Study for a little bit, get up, move around, walk down the hallway, get you a drink of water, come back. The trick is, is not to get caught down there. 
but his room was visited for an hour and a half. But to make it back to where you study, if you study in short sessions, you'll have a lot more first and last, and you'll remember a lot more information a lot quicker. How many of you ever been studying in the middle of the night, and you look in there and you've read that same page six times, and you still don't know what the heck's on that page? You ever been there? Yeah. I'm going to read that again. You're wasting time. It's not doing you any good at all. You need to study when you're well rested. Study when you're well rested. Study in short sessions. Study when you're well rested. Always go to class. So studies have shown that a typical four-year degree will increase a person's earnings over $600,000 in their lifetime. Taking the number of hours that you would be in class and then for a four-year degree and dividing it out into that $600,000 extra earning, that comes to almost $1,000 an hour. If you miss that class, can you make up that $1,000 in your lifetime? If you miss that one hour of class, do you miss that $1,000 in your lifetime? It's your mind. Don't miss your classes. You already paid for them, so make sure you show up. <clears throat> Don't let all the hard courses fool you. You've probably got a course that you've already looked at your course. What course you got to take? Is that's going to be tough. Don't let it fool you. Don't let it worry you. If you're in a field that you enjoy, you can excel at it. There are several other tricks you can do. You can audit a course. Have you ever heard of auditing a course? That means you can go in there, you can pay your $145, sit in there at the course, take all the notes, but you don't ever get a grade for it. You don't ever, ever take a test. But Next semester, that tough course that you never thought you could pass, you can pay your 140 bucks again for that three hours and take that course again. And you've already been through it once, haven't you? You can audit a course. You can do that with something that you know, completely out of your field. Maybe you want to take photography just because you want to be able to take better snapshots. You don't want to grade for it on your transcript, but you just want to take it so you can learn a little bit about it. You can audit the course that way. That way you can get through that tough course. You've been through it once, didn't get a grade on it. Then you go through it again and get a good grade. How much time do you spend talking to your buddy about that blind date he set up for you? Or she set up for you? You spend a little time, don't you? How long is that blind date going to be? Two or three hours? How long are you going to be in class with this sorry instructor? No. <laughs> well, not today. <laughs> You're going to spend 70 to 75 to 90 hours with me, aren't you? Select your instructors carefully. There is a difference. Get what you pay for. Talk to the other students. Find out what they learned. Who did the job? Who would help them? Choose your instructor carefully when you have the opportunity for a board. It can make a difference in why you, how you succeed in that process. <coughs> if you get your textbooks early, didn't have a chance this time, the next semester you're going to be pre-enrolling for school. If you go ahead and pick up your textbooks, early and just read through that first 50 pages or so of that textbook. How are you doing compared to the rest of the class now? You're ahead of them, aren't you? When you get out ahead of everybody else, you're probably going to be successful. When being successful feels good, doesn't it? It feels good to be successful. And that's probably going to make you want to continue to be successful. 
and you already got a head start, so it's not hard to keep out of here. Keep working at it. Okay, we talked about studying when you get drowsy, kind of like you are right now. Man, your head just keeps going boom in that table, right? Golly, it's hard to stay awake for two hours straight like that. What do you need to do? You ever have those days when you're trying to study? You have those same times? Oh, drink coffee. Well, yeah, it'll help a little bit, but I found out working in the trucking industry, coffee usually keeps you awake as long as it's hot and you got it held over your lap. So when you get drowsy, it goes like this. You go, oh, oh, oh. Coffee will usually keep you awake there. If it gets cold, it may not keep you awake. Some of the things you need to do is under, understand a little bit about human physiology, how we're built, how we work. One of the easiest things that you can do while you're sitting here in your dorm room is this. Well, that's close. Yeah, we got my recliner here. Put your feet up. What does that do for you? It allows the blood to go to your head. Same thing as first aid for a person that's in shock. We're trying to keep the blood flow to their head. Keep them from passing out. You're trying to keep them passing out, right? Get your feet lifted up. That'll help some. One of the best things you can do, the same thing, what do you do when you, how many of you take a long road trip? Going out there driven four, five, six hours, ten hours. Man, there in the middle of the night, about four o'clock in the morning, it gets really tough. But what do you do? Stay away. Drink coffee, turn the radio up. Stop and get out and walk around. Take it down. These are all good things. Did they help you drive safely? Did you get to your destination? Can you use the same techniques when you're trying to study and you get drowsy? Now, here you go. Kick this tire. Kick that tire. Oh, now I feel better. Now, ready to go drive, right? I can drive another 15, 20, 30 minutes before I drive off the edge of the road again. <laughs> right? Can you do that when you're trying to study and get drowsy? Yeah. Go out for a quick walk around the house or a quick walk down the block or a quick down the hallway. Get a little bit of exercise. What you have done then is you've raised your heartbeat. You've started breathing faster. You have oxygenated your blood. You're getting more oxygen up to this thing up here that requires oxygen to work. By increasing your oxygen level, you'll increase your awareness and your alertness. And you will learn faster. You won't waste time reading that same page six times. Okay, some people said take a nap. It's exactly right. If you're out there on that road trip and you kept <laughs> driven off the side of it and you got out and exercised, you'd be amazed what a 30-minute nap would do for you. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. The only problem is making sure that when that alarm or buzzer goes off, you get back up and you got to get on down the road. Or you got to get back up and study some more. 30-minute nap will do a lot for your alertness and your awareness. Sometimes you get to the point where that's not even going to help. Then, probably the best solution is to go to sleep. Figure out how much study you need to do before tomorrow. And if you think, well, it's going to take, should take me another hour, and I'll be ready. Set your alarm clock an hour early, go to bed, get a good night's rest. Then that hour in the morning, a study is going to do you a lot more good. You're going to retain a lot more of that information when you're well rested. So you saw the same tricks that you used to build continued driving to build continued study. 
Then reading, increase your reading comprehension. I'll talk about read that page six times, tell them what's on there. Read out loud. What does reading out loud do for you? What senses are you using? That you're hearing, you're speaking, you're seeing. If you're reading silently, what senses are you using? We're seeing, aren't we? So we're putting information to one location in our brain. We read out loud, we're reading active, we're putting information, the same information to three different centers in our brain. Which one do we have the best chance of recalling? We got it one time or we got it three times? Okay. Read out loud will increase your comprehension. Or read actively. Take notes as you read. Now we're using our muscle system, our touch, aren't we? Increase it, brings in another one. Okay, how do you expect those uh, instructors wrote that test out, out of that book? They read through that book and said, oh, this looks like a good question. Oh, here's another good question. Now, if you go through reading and you're writing questions down and found the answers to them, you've already taken the test, haven't you? You know what's going to be on the test. You already written it out and you took it yourself. How much more study do you need to do? Does that save you any time? Write your notes out. Or write as you read. Take notes as you read. Okay. We're a couple of weeks in, three weeks into semester now. So it's a little late right now, but you can still do it. That first semester, first two weeks of semester, launching all that attack. Charge into it. Dedicate yourself to it. Again, you'll be successful. And to be successful feels good. Take advantage of it. Don't be late for class or leave early. Why not? Yeah, you're probably going to miss something. Now I'm going to give you a test today. I got my test paper out here. And, oh, yesterday, remember when we were talking about so-and-so? Well, I forgot to tell you that by doing this, to turn the defibrillator over to the decaffeinator and then twist around to the and okay, everybody understand that now? Okay, now you walk into class and I hand out the test. Guess what's going to be on that test? That information I just covered. That information that I forgot to tell you about yesterday. And when you walked in afterwards, guess what you missed? Always be there on time. Pick up the little test. Little thing may not happen every day, but what's the difference between being best and being mediocre? Little things. Isn't it? Okay. Never leave early, especially on test day. Is the first paper in on my desk the best one? Never. Very, very seldom. Yeah. You know, it seems to be. People think, my gosh, how'd they get done with that so fast? They must have known everything and just you know, poured it out there on the paper. Doesn't happen. Don't be in a hurry to get out. Don't be in a hurry to finish that test out. Take your time with it. And guess what? If you know there's just five or six people left in that classroom and you know, question number ten, you go, hey, Mr. Ackermeyer, uh, on question number ten here. I don't quite understand what you mean by, you know, this set of, this wording here. Could you kind of clarify it for me? Well, guess what? I'm probably going to do it. So, well, remember, you know, when we was talking on the board, you know, two weeks ago, I went, I drew this picture up there. Who's going to get the advantage of that? Everybody that's still there, aren't they? What about those folks that already headed out the door? They missed it. Is that fair? Did I cheat those folks that had already left? Yeah. I'm probably not going to give an answer, but I do this because I like to share information. And I have a real hard time when somebody's asking me, hey, what, how does this work? I have a real hard time. I can't tell you that right now. I'm going to try to 
draw it out of you, pull it out of you. So that you'll have to take on with the rest of life. Always do extra credit work. This is probably the single biggest thing you can do to raise your grade. If the teacher says this is extra credit, you can do it if you want to. Don't worry about it if you don't have to. Make yourself do it. Over there for me, once a semester, we have a blood drive here on campus. My students, I say, all right, three extra points added to your final average if you participate in the blood drive. Either by donating blood or going out and handing out cookies and punch or whatever. Some people can't give blood. But if they go over there and donate their time for an hour, same thing. Now, what if you had an 89 after I averaged up all your score? What grade do you have? You got a B, don't you? What if you went over there and spent an hour handing out cookies and punch? You got a 92. That's not it. How much work would it take to get from that, you know, how good a grade would you have to get on that final test to get your total average from an 89 to a 92? Probably couldn't even do it. Even if you made 100, or 110, or 120. How long did you have to study for that test? How many hours did you spend on homework to be able to raise your final average score three points? Probably a lot more than that one hour doing that extra credit work for that two hours doing that extra credit work. Make extra credit work mandatory for yourself. <clears throat> over at the Cade Center, over at the LRC, where you so you may take some computerized tests, or you will go through it as you go through this and learn how to take computerized tests. There are also study guides over there. The person that wrote the test that you're going to be taking wrote the study guide that you can bring up before you took the test or before you take the test. If you know what's on the study guide, you're probably going to know what's on the test. Take advantage of it. Use those study guides over there. Okay, how many of you ever took a test and no matter how, how much you study, you looked at a question there and you say, where did this come from? I don't have any idea in the world what they're even talking about. How many of you have seen that? Yeah. Well, this is a list of techniques for making best guesses on tests. By studying the psychology of test writing, how people write tests, by studying this group of standardized tests, came up with a list of ways to guess best. Increase your chances. Increase your odds. Instead of having four to one odds, now you get two to one odds. If you increase your chances from four to one to two to one and you're playing poker, what happens? You're more apt to win, aren't you? Right? This is the way you're more apt to win when you take tests, by increasing your chances on those questions you don't have any idea what it means. I actually saw one group of people, saw research on one group of people that went through an extended seminar on how to take tests, were given tests over information they had no idea about, never studied, never seen it in their life, and grades ran as high or averaged up near 75% on information they knew nothing about simply because they knew how to take a test. Has anybody ever told you that stuff before? How many of you started getting real upset with your grade school and high school teacher now? Never told you how to take a test. Okay. Multiple choice test. If two of the four choices are opposites, choose one of those two. Get the psychology of test writing. If there are opposites there, choose one of the two opposites. Now, if you've narrowed your choices down from four to two, your chances of guessing correctly are better, aren't they? B, C, and D answers. If five point multiple or five 
part of multiple choice answers are the best choices. If you're guessing, don't choose A or E. Chances are they are not correct. Now, there are chances down to one and five to one and three. We've got a better chance of guessing correctly. The void pairs. This is probably the only one you ever seen. If number 27 is A, don't make 28 A. Right? I heard that one in class. Somewhere down the line. Don't choose pairs. Non answers, zero or none of the above, are very poor choices. If you're guessing, don't choose one of them. It's not. How many things are never, none, in life? They're just, there aren't any, are they? Everything's shades of gray. It's always sometimes, maybe, might. Very few things are never or done. The question asks for the most or least, pick the answer that's next to the most or least. Like in the example there, it says, choose the most of 4, 8, 9, 15, or 30. Choose 15. It's probably correct. Again, psychology of test writing. You don't normally put the answer to the outside. All of the above is generally a good guess. All of the above is generally a good guess. Longest multiple choice answers are good guesses. Why is that? Got more information, doesn't it? It'll be more specific. It's like more correct. If two out of four choices are almost identical, pick the longest of the two. Again, same reason. Probably get is more precise, more correct. If a question asks for a plural or singular answer, make sure that your answer is plural or singular on that multiple choice. Another big tip is and blank or a blank if it says this is a it's not going to be a apple is it it's going to be a cat whatever that word that comes after a is going to be a consonant isn't it now if it says an it's going to be apple isn't it because after an comes a vowel match those up most instructors can use the English language fairly well. Yeah, times. So, use the English language and the rules of good English to help them move the test. When limiting words such as all, never, always, must are used, false is usually a better choice. Very, thing, very few things are that way in life. When general terms like both, some, usually, or might are used. That's the way things, most things in life are, aren't they? That's a good choice. Exaggerated, complex answers are generally false. Boy, I love those. <coughs> uh, this morning, earlier in the group, I had some students that are in their class with me already. So they start to see some of those wild, crazy. So, see, I've got a bad bad habit. I, I know these things here. So I could rearrange my test, not the Okay. Answer every question. You'd be amazed how many test papers I get back, multiple choice tests, and somebody left one out. Darn. Take a guess. Fill in every blank. Man, even if it's ridiculous, maybe while the instructor's grading that paper, you make him laugh. And they give you at least partial credit for it, even if it was a stupid answer. Never leave a blank. Fill in everything. On the essay exams, Write neatly, write legibly, have a large volume. Paper, and it's all one big long paragraph, 
What does that say to that teacher? I knew one thing about this. But if you got four or five paragraphs on that page, what does it say psychologically? I knew four or five different things about this. And guess what? Sometimes you might fool them. Even if you said the same thing in paragraph two that you said in paragraph one, but turn the words around sideways. It'll work. Now, probably doesn't make you any better student, but it can get you a better grade. Okay. Use short paragraphs on essays. Reread the directions on your exam before you turn the paper in. Like it says here, did you mistakenly define the terms when you were supposed to compare the terms? Easy deal to do. So make sure you reread the instructions. There is one test block around here on campus. Then it's got a whole page full of instructions. I mean, just instructing you off on these questions, do that on the end, and a whole page of instructions. And then there's three or four more pages back behind that where the actual test is. And down there towards the bottom of that page of instructions, it says, if you read all the way down here, sign your name at the top of the paper and hand it in, the test is over. But those folks that read the first three lines say, I know how to take a test flip over. They spend the next two hours taking a test and get graded on it. Those that can follow instructions, write their name on the paper and hand it in, get 100. Many of your technical <laughs> professions that you're in, it's very important to follow instructions. Isn't it? If you don't follow instructions, you're going to tear up somebody's equipment or something. Very important to follow instructions. You need to read those instructions carefully. Answers that pop into your head are usually good choices. Use your intuition. Remember, I told you everything you've read, seen, heard, smelled, done, tasted is in your mind. Sometimes you just can't bring it out to the conscious, but your subconscious is back there working. It knows it already. And somewhere out of the blue, boom! says answer B is right. B. Don't change it. Always follow your intuition. It will probably be right. The only reason to change that answer is if you get down further in the test and you find the answer in another question. It's the only reason to change that first guess. Always stay at the very end of the test. Be one of the last to leave. We'll talk about that with you. Okay. Never turn in homework late, sloppily done, or unedited. For me, if it's a day late, if I decide to accept it, because it's my prerogative, if I want to take late homework or not. If I do take it a day late, the best you're going to make is a 90. If it's two days late, the best you're going to make is an 80, because that's where I'm going to start subtracting from. Don't turn in late. I don't have to take it. Don't turn it in sloppy. Because if it's sloppy, it's hard to read. I get tired of reading all these papers. It's tough work to grade all that stuff. And if it's sloppy, I'm not pleased. I don't like to work any harder than I have to, just like you. Turn it in deep. Have somebody else edit the paper for you. That's one of the best ways to write a good paper. You write it out. And then if you write it, you type it, and then you go right back and read it, you read what you think you wrote. How many of you ever turned in a paper that you thought was super great, good, that came back and looked like you'd been stabbed to death? Bleeding everywhere. 
if you allow one of your friends to read that for you, they don't know what it is supposed to say. They read what it really does say. And then you can edit that. Return the favor. <clears throat> Written work is a game of comparisons. I'm going to compare this stack of papers. The neatest, best looking, and probably the one that gets closest to my instructions is going to get the A. Make sure your paper is neat. Make sure it's legible. Make sure it's clean. Make sure you follow the instructions. It may not be the best written paper. A lot of the people that are in your technologies probably are not English teachers. They're probably not composition teachers. Is this fair? No, it's not fair, but it's the way it works. Make sure your papers are neat. Have someone else edit it. The essay exams. Quality, short paragraphs, and neatness counts. Okay, back here on the last pages, it says five steps to better writing. Guess what? You're not going to find this in the English book. This is business writing. You're sitting down at the conference table or you're sitting down at lunch and you and your buddy gets talking, we need to get this done, this done, and this done, and where you write it down, you write it down on the napkin there beside you. And then you stick that napkin in and take it back to the office. You do your structural outline. You list five or six main points that you want to cover. Then you do a sentence outline that says here. You write a sentence that goes with each one of those words. But you write that sentence on a piece of paper about half, write one sentence and skip about a half a page of paper, write another sentence, skip a half a page of paper, write another sentence. How many of you ever written a piece, you know, been writing a paper, and here you are up here on paragraph one just writing away, and you got some fantastic, oh man, what a wild thought. This is going to be great for down here at the end. But then you keep on writing, and when you get down here to the end of the paper, boy, I know I had a heck of an idea, but what was it? Have you ever done that? If you'll write your topic sentence, Skip about half a page of paper. Whenever you have that fantastic flash of an idea, you skip over there to paragraph five and whip her down. Now, after you get your paragraph where you get these sentences in, you fill out these paragraphs with your ideas, and you bounce it back and forth, and then smooth your ideas out, recast your paragraph. Make it close, smooth it, get the punch away from writing all this stuff. And the last step is to have someone else edit it for you. If you can't have someone else edit it for you, Slide it aside for at least an hour or two or a day or two is better, and then reread it yourself and edit it. Study by your biological clock. How many of you feel fantastic early in the morning? This is when you really love to be out and getting going. How many of you really get going about 10 o'clock at night? You know when you feel best. That's when to study. When you're really going, so that's when you need to study. Study for the biological law. Okay. I guess before we go, I need to stamp your passports. So you get those out. I enjoy visiting with you. I hope you enjoy it. Hope it works.